uh, the back. Um, Galat- uh, sorry, yes, Galatians uh, chapter 2 and the first uh, 10 verses. So we're continuing um, basically where we left off a month or so ago, if you're here. And uh, you might remember that in chapter 1, uh, Paul has been addressing the Galatians, uh, particularly about the gospel, and um, uh, trying to impress upon them the fact that the gospel um, was given to him by revelation and was given to, uh, not given to him by any uh, man or by any teaching. It came directly by Jesus Christ. And in the second chapter, he's further developing um, the arguments that he is making to the Galatians about um, where the gospel has come from and um, his authority in uh, uh, giving the gospel to them originally. So this is chapter 2 and verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem, this time with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. That uh, race metaphor again. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. As for those who were held in high esteem, whatever they were makes no difference to me. God does not show favouritism. They added nothing to my message. On the contrary, they recognised that I had been entrusted with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognised the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I had been eager to do all along. Well, it's always uh, tragic when Christians uh, fall out or, um, or when they just can't agree on something. And Paul's meeting with the apostles in Jerusalem, which this passage is about, was pretty high stakes. Would there be unity over the gospel that he preached to the Gentiles? Um, It wasn't a given uh, to him uh, that that would be the case. And uh, although he knew that the gospel had been given to him by Jesus, by direct revelation, uh, would the other apostles see it that that way? Would they see things eye to eye uh, with him? Well, as we've read in this passage, uh, and as Paul tells us, uh, there was, in fact, unity. So that's what I want to take us through. That is the uh, essential theme, I think, of these ten verses. Uh, Unity in the gospel. Unity, first of all, in the truth of the gospel, which is verses uh, 1 to 6. This would come up on the slide, but uh, it's not going to appear, obviously. Uh, Unity in spreading the gospel uh, to all people, which is verses 7 to 9. And then just that last verse, verse 10, unity in concern for the poor. So I'm going to work through those um, three uh, headings uh, with you. So first of all, Paul is, is relieved, I think, that there was unity in the truth of the gospel, verses 1 to 6. So after 14 years, Paul says, with Barnabas and with Titus, he goes up to Jerusalem for a meeting with the apostles there. Now you might remember back in chapter 1, he has already been once previously to Jerusalem. That was after three years 
since his conversion. So there's been an intervening either 11-year gap or, depends on how we count it, a 14-year gap uh, from um, that three years since he'd previously seen them. And he's not seen them at all in all that time. It's a long time, if you think about it, 14 uh, years or possibly 11. To be honest, we can't be certain which meeting in Acts, if you look at Acts, uh, this meeting that Paul describes in Galatians refers to. So the first or the second time that Paul goes up to uh, Jerusalem is described for us in Acts chapter 11. There's just two or three verses there towards the end of the chapter where he goes up to Jerusalem from Antioch with aid from um, the Christians in Antioch there because there had been a famine. You might remember uh, that incident in Acts. Agabus, a prophet, had prophesied that there would be a famine over the entire Roman world. And the relatively rich Antioch Christians decided it would be good to help the brothers and sisters living in Judea. And that revelation might well have been the revelation that Paul is talking about here in Galatians chapter 2. He went up to Jerusalem because of a revelation. It might have been Agabus uh, speaking. We're not sure. Uh, and uh, Luke gives uh, very few details of what happened in that meeting in Acts chapter 11. So some actually think that it may well be the meeting in Acts chapter 15. If you're following this, Acts 15 is where there was a major meeting in Jerusalem, sometimes called the Jerusalem Council, um, where the point at issue was the degree uh, to which the Gentiles should conform to Jewish laws. Um, and many people believe that that's what's being described in Acts chapter two, uh, sorry, in Galatians chapter two here. I'm not quite sure, to be honest. I, I tend to uh, um, move towards Acts chapter 11. Uh, what's being described in Galatians here appears to be a fairly private meeting, whereas in Acts 15, if you compare it, it's a m very much a public church uh, meeting, and, and some of the details don't quite square. To be honest, it doesn't really matter uh, for our purposes. Um, the, the Paul's purpose was, was pr to present to them uh, the Galatians, the gospel of grace that he preached among the Gentiles and he was going to Jerusalem to see if there was going to be uh, any agreement. Remember he'd been working independently from the apostles for 14 years. Was it possible that what he'd been preaching to the Gentiles for those 14 years was wrong? Had he got it wrong? Had he got it right? In many ways, if you think about it, it would be remarkable if they agreed on everything since they'd been so separate from each other for such a long period. Remember, there were no, no phones, no smartphones, no Zoom meetings, no way of discussing the gospel message unless they actually met face to face. I suppose they could have had the odd letter exchange, but as far as, as, far as we know, they haven't. So it's not surprising, I think, that Paul seems to go with some nervousness. And a number of things, when you read closely into these first six verses, indicate, I think, that Paul was uh, nervous to some extent as he goes up to Jerusalem. Firstly, the meeting between him and the apostles, he says, was a private meeting. That's in verse 2. He doesn't seem ready to have a public discussion. If there was going to be disagreement, he wanted time to explain and discuss things before they became uh, public, possibly to try and resolve things. And secondly, he says that he was concerned, and I think this is a crucial um, clue about the, the, his nervousness, that he would find out that he had been running his race in vain. It's a phrase he uses elsewhere. Once, once uh, more in, in Philippians, he uses a similar uh, phrase. And I take this to mean that he anticipated 
that there might be disagreement and that therefore much of his work might be undermined by any disagreement that there was between the apostles in Jerusalem and him. Not only would it represent a breakdown in unity amongst Christians, but the truth of the gospel would be undermined. It wasn't that Paul in any sense thought he'd got the gospel wrong. That's, that's apparent from chapter 1. He knew that the gospel had come to him direct by revelation from Jesus. But would the other apostles agree with what he said? But thirdly, um, I, I think his um, nervousness is perhaps represented by the fact that he took uh, Titus with him. Now we're told that Titus is or was a Gentile who naturally had therefore not been circumcised as a Jew. Would this cause problems? Or would Titus be accepted as a fellow believer and... Would he be put under pressure to be circumcised, even as an adult? Some think that Paul uh, took him deliberately as a kind of test case, but he doesn't actually say that explicitly here. In fact, uh, I, I think that's possibly a wrong deduction. But remarkably, there was agreement. There was unity. Uh, presumably much to the relief of Paul and his companions. We know that because in verse 6, Paul says that those who uh, were held in high esteem, um, the apostles, James, Peter and John, who are mentioned a bit later in verse, uh, verse 9, uh, those added nothing to his message. In other words... He found that his message and theirs were in agreement. There was nothing to add from the apostles, and presumably the apostles in their turn didn't think there was anything to add to their message. So there was agreement. The gospel of grace, which is the core message uh, of the gospel, was what both parties agreed on. Both Jews and Gentiles are saved by grace. But there was this potential problem, which is outlined for us in verses 3 to 5. Paul talks about false believers, or brothers, who he accuses of spying on them. Now, it's not clear how they did this, what the precise circumstances were, uh, but the upshot was that they discovered that Titus was uncircumcised and argued that this was a requirement to become a true believer. If you're a Gentile who's become a Christian, be baptised, yes, but also be circumcised. Why? Because that is a requirement of the law. And for Paul, the truth of the gospel was at stake. Because the truth is that God saves us by grace and sets us free from the requirements of the law. We're no longer slaves to the law but free. And this is a theme that he will uh, expand on at great length later in the letter. Obeying the law and its requirements is not what saves us. It's God's grace that saves us through faith. And to add elements of the law to our salvation will be undermining its truth. And that's why he calls his opponents false brothers. Now, of course, Paul doesn't mean that we're free to do what we're like when we're saved. As he makes clear later in chapter 5, we're not to use our freedom to indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, we're to live by the Spirit with the fruit that the Spirit produces. He doesn't even mean that the law counts for nothing. The law is fulfilled, he says, in the command to love your neighbour as yourself. A command of the law to love your neighbour is still a command which we are enjoined to obey. The law still counts, but it's not what saves us. And Paul stood his ground for the truth against these false brothers, and he says that Titus was not compelled to be circumcised. And he tells the Galatians that this is great news for them, 
at the end of uh, verse 5. It tells them that uh, it means that the truth of the gospel was preserved for them. They were free, not in bondage to the law or to circumcision, which they were coming under pressure to conform to. They were not to be burdened. Rather, the gospel of grace was maintained for them. Now, that's the case for us today as well. The gospel of grace through faith has been preserved down through the centuries, and we need to maintain the truth of the gospel. It's, it's the theme uh, that Paul has already stressed, and I think I've stressed uh, in, from chapter 1. Being alert to false teachers who would seek to add to the gospel, seeking uh, to uphold the truth of the gospel, particularly from those who claim to be believers, is vital to us as Christians. And as believers, we all have a responsibility in that. Let me give you an example. Uh, the Methodist Church, as I think most of you know, recently, only about uh, two or three weeks ago, decided to allow same-sex marriage in their church buildings. It's not the first church uh, to do it. I think uh, ones in Scotland have done it. And I expect it will not be uh, the last. Now, are they following the truth of the gospel? I'm sure many in the Methodist church would claim that they are. Otherwise, they wouldn't have voted for that to come into place. But just as the circumcisers claimed that they followed the true gospel, are the Methodists, in this case, following the true gospel? The Bible clearly teaches that marriage is between a man and a woman. Is that part of the gospel message? Well, for me at least, it is, because the gospel is about a new life in Christ, about following him and his teaching. And Jesus clearly assumed that marriage from the beginning was designed by God between a man and a woman. So I, for one, uh, can't in all conscience be true to the gospel unless I make that clear and plain. It provides us with some difficulties in our uh, culture today. But secondly, in this passage, God brings unity in spreading the gospel. That's verses 6 uh, to 9. So he underlines uh, the unity that there was between him and the other apostles. For Paul, it didn't matter what position uh, the Jerusalem apostles held in the church. He knew that they were all, him and the other apostles, treated the same way by God. God shows no partiality, no favoritism, he says in verse 6. On the basis of their positions or how others regard them. What matters is the truth of the gospel. And that, in the end, is what united the apostles. Firstly, in verse 7, there was unity in appreciating the different spheres of mission that God had assigned. Paul uh, said that he was um, assigned to the uncircumcised, to the Gentiles. Peter was assigned to the circumcised, to the Jews. Of course, there was some crossover. Paul often started his preaching in, in uh, a town he visited with the Jews and then moved on to the Gentiles. Uh, Peter uh, may have measured on the Jews, but we know that he also preached to the Gentiles. But there was unity in uh, applying and agreeing with the spheres of responsibility that they would have, at least at that stage of um, the mission. Secondly, in verse 8, there was unity in appreciating that God was at work in both Peter and Paul's work. So the Jerusalem apostles and Paul recognised that it was God who was at work. It was God who was calling the Gentiles to repentance and faith. It was God who was calling the Jews to live by grace. Ultimately, it's God who was bringing unity through and in the gospel. And historically, th this was a great breakthrough as together they appreciated that God was building 
a people from every tribe, language and nation, both Jew and Gentile alike. God's plan was for the whole world to hear the gospel, something that hadn't necessarily been apparent, you'll remember, to the early apostles. The gospel of grace with nothing added, salvation by grace and grace alone, is for the whole world. And it's God who is doing this and bringing about this unity of purpose. And then thirdly, in verse 9, the apostles, James, Peter and John, in recognising the grace given to Paul, held out the right hand of fellowship to both Paul and Barnabas. Paul had come with some nervousness to the meeting with the apostles, and given their lack of interaction after such a long period, would there be this disagreement? Would the work that he'd be doing be undermined? Far from it. There was this strong sense of fellowship with each other. They were united in fellowship with Christ and in fellowship with one another. A real togetherness as they united to spread the gospel to both the Gentiles and the Jews. And when the Galatians read this way back 2,000 years, um, they must have been encouraged by what Paul was saying. The apostles were united together in spreading the gospel. And that had been undermined by the people, the false teachers that had come in amongst the Galatians. They'd given the impression that there was disunity, which was in fact far from the case. Well, what about us today? I think we, sh we too, of course, should be united in spreading uh, the gospel to all, remembering that it is God who brings uh, unity. It's so often um, what can unite us as Christians, the desire to spread the gospel. Of course, we're more likely to be affected when there is love between us. As Jesus said, uh, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. But let's face it, um, Christians do disagree from time to time. We, we see that frequently in the letters uh, themselves, sometimes on minor issues, sometimes on big issues. And as a church, we may be small, we may not always agree on everything, but being united in spreading the gospel is so important and is what Paul was so pleased to demonstrate to the Galatians uh, as he uh, met with the other apostles. But what about partnering with other churches or with organisations? I think it is a tricky one. To what degree should we be united? What differences can we set aside? Does that issue of same-sex marriage prove too high a barrier? One of the uh, great things uh, about the Billy Graham Crusades, which uh, most of you will remember, was the way in which Christians set aside uh, differences to prioritise the gospel, to unite uh, in preaching the gospel. Something we tried to do uh, at university uh, in the CU when I was involved in that many years ago. Christians from all kinds of backgrounds united in a desire to spread the good news to fellow students, setting aside quite a lot of differences that we had between us. And it is good to be open to partnering with others in sharing the good news, as we have as a church over the years. But there will be limits on who we can partner with from time to time. But thirdly, and lastly, uh, Paul is eager for there to be unity for the poor, verse 10. So just one verse here, and I must admit, uh, I was tempted to gloss over uh, this last verse uh, in our passage. It didn't seem to be at the heart of Paul's argument, a bit of an aside at the end of this section. But then I realised that it follows this theme of unity, which he is keen to stress. The Jerusalem apostles were keen to help the poor and he too was eager to do just that. 
they were in fact united in their desire to help the poor. And we know that Paul did just that. In fact, he embarks upon a major fundraising campaign as he travelled around on his missionary journeys through Turkey and through Greece, he realised how wealthy, in relative terms, the Gentiles were, the converts, in comparison with the relative poverty in the Judean churches, possibly as a result of the persecution that uh, those churches experienced early on. And he organised for money to be collected to help the Christians in Judea. Uh, in fact, the Galatians themselves, who this letter is addressed to, were later, not at this point I think, but later to be involved in this. Uh, no doubt remembering what Paul had said in this letter about the need to be united in helping the poor. So if you turn back a few pages to 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 to 2, uh, there's what, a few verses there, uh, many uh, verses, in fact, through the letters, which make reference to this collection. And it's uh, interesting that it makes reference to the Galatian churches. It says this, now about the collection for the Lord's people. So this is the collection for the Judean uh, churches, the poor there. Do what I told the Galatian churches, he tells the Corinthian church. Uh, On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. The richer churches were united in a desire to help the poorer churches in a practical way through monetary support. What about us today? Well, we too need to be united, not just in the truth of the gospel, not just in spreading the gospel, but in helping Christians less fortunate than ourselves Uh, and I know many of us uh, do just that through organizations like uh, Tear Fund or through uh, the Stafford's work in Malawi with with Lapson and I'm sure some of you uh, support others as well it's not just overseas of course where there can be poverty in this country as Christians against poverty you do a great work particularly amongst those uh, in debt And it's good, I think, to take stock uh, every now and again and ask ourselves, what am I doing to help Christians who are financially in need, who are in relative poverty? Maybe we've neglected that side of our giving or maybe uh, we need to reprioritize it. Certainly something that Paul was keen that Christians should be united over. So let me encourage you to consider your giving Uh, and the needs that there are. Because being united in concern for the poor is a sign of real unity in the gospel. So just to finish, Psalm 133 verse 1 says this, How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. And this passage highlights the unity that uh, we should strive for in guarding the truth of the gospel, in spreading the truth of the gospel, the good news to all, and in our practical concern for those less wealthy than ourselves, particularly our Christian brothers and sisters. How's it going, Chris? Okay. <laughs> I'll pray, and then we'll have a go at seeing if uh, one of the videos uh, will play so we can...